Welcome, Bruce. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I would like to acknowledge the land in which we meet today. This land belongs to the Gadigal people. The Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. This land has never been ceded. This land is the traditional land of First Nation people. So I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal people, both past, present, and emerging. For they are the memories, the tradition, the hopes, and culture for Aboriginal Australia. I'd also like to say that under this concrete and stone, this is, and always will be, traditional Aboriginal land. I'd like to extend that acknowledgement of all the clan groups that are within the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation extends to the north, to the Orkesby River, and to the west, to the Nepean, to the edge of the Blue Mountains, and down south, to Wollongong. And I'd like to acknowledge those people that come from faraway land that are now called Australia home. Welcome. Thank you. Marawari and Buddhist man, a water activist um, and an artist. Uh, well, thanks for taking part, everyone. We have an interesting lineup of to topics and speakers today. The overarching theme in today's seminar and indeed in all progressive movements' deliberations is the climate crisis and what we can do about it. We have titled today Socialism today, though, some people would be asking why. We don't have much time to turn this climate crisis producing system around. 11 years to be precise. So why bring socialism into it? Well, given how quickly capitalism has stuffed things up, about 200 years, only anti-capitalist solutions to the current crises are going to cut it. We'll get into those discussions in more depth. The panel, which I'll introduce shortly, will look at some of the contemporary discussions and activism around the Green New Deal. Following that, two workshops, one on Marxism today, Peter Boyle, and another on tactics in the climate movement, Peter Hitman, P Pip Hitman, will look at in more depth at the problem and possible solutions. Also, there's more coffee for everyone if you want some more caffeine. It's completely me. We'll also be hearing from Sudanese Australians of summer and May Sue on the incredible struggle for democracy in Sudan. We'll discuss the rise of reactionary outfits and the left's response across Europe and the United States. Lastly, our panel will look at how to build the movement for the 99%, and we're pleased to have Mark from the Australian Workers' Party and Jim Casey from the Greens to take part. A bit of housekeeping. There's toilets down the corridor to the left, but you need a swiper. The swiper is just below the, white, the activist whiteboard board there. There are also toilets without swipers, just up the, up the stairs on the first floor. There's tea and coffee, there's a tasty lunch, and there's snacks um, that'll be available at the, um, after the, after, in the breaks. And lastly today, we're launching the Become a Supporter of Green Left Weekly Drive. If you like protest press, and Green Left has been around for 27 years, and it's renowned in the English-speaking world, become an ongoing supporter for just $5 a month for a digital copy, $10 or $20 for a digital copy or a hard copy of the newspaper. This, la this drive lasts until August the 11th, and if you jump in now, Free Left Weekly will give you a first uh, free month. But now onto our panel. The climate crisis and responses. Is a Green New Deal enough? Well, on the panel we have Parker Craig, who is a school striker and an Extinction Rebellion member. We have Steve O'Brien, who is a former steel worker and now educator, and Penny McGall Howard, who is an activist and author of Environment, Labour, Capitalism at Sea, working the ground in Scotland. And I'll just introduce Penny a little bit more. Um, she's a member of Solidarity and worked in the Australian and International Union movement for eight years. Um, including climate change work with the Maritime Union of Australia and the International Transport Workers Federation, ITF. Her book uh, makes a Marxist analysis of human-environment relations and it won a global prize from the American Anthropological Association for the Anthropology of Work. It will be available in the Resistance Bookshop in paperback quite soon. Um, the price comes down when it goes to paperback, so um, it'll be a month or two. She has been an activist in global justice, anti-war and refugee rights movement and currently trying to contribute to building the union and workers' participation in the September 20 climate strike. 
Um, so we'll hear from our speakers. Um, first we'll hear from Parker and then Penny and then Steve and then we'll open up the floor for discussion. So take it away Parker. Okay. So, so um, as you heard I'm a part of School Strike for Climate as well as Extinction Rebellion and I do a lot of other stuff as well. I'm involved with obviously Socialist Alliance as well and Green Left. Um, and I just wanted to talk about um, what the reaction is sort of in schools and in communities to School Strike and XR. Generally, I mean, I go to a Catholic school, um, so it's, ve it's very varied opinions um, in my school. There are teachers who support it, but they generally can't say that because all the schools in Sydney, the diocese, they had to have a meeting about the second strike and basically say to them, legally you cannot support the students and legally they cannot wear their uniforms to the strike. So none of the teachers or anyone who has any sort of authority at my school can come out and officially say they support the strike and they can't really say what it is, what it's about, they just sort of call it September 20th. Um, they do, at least in my school, they let us, they have like a system and they let us go. Um, but I have heard of other schools where they like locked front gates and they kept students in and wouldn't let them out to the strikes, which is really, really terrific. Um, and there are teachers at my school, weirdly enough, this is a geography teacher, and she called the school strike as idiots. Um, it's so weird coming from a geography teacher as well. Um, and it's always really varied opinions. Um, a lot of my friends, we are very concerned about um, our current politics, the climate emergency, obviously, um, but a lot of them don't really care about the climate on a daily level. It's really, they really only care about the climate when they get a day off school. And it's really frustrating continuing trying to motivate people to care about the climate emergency sort of every now and again when it's not just a strike. And I think that's probably the biggest struggle in the movement, um, especially with you know the upcoming strike. Everyone's really keyed up about it, but they don't really go to other events that happen, you know, like Stoffordani protests or other protests that happen. And it's really frustrating because I'm always trying to um, get them to do that, and they don't. It's difficult because they don't really listen and. Um, that's more what I'm trying to do, but there is, you know, a big support for School Strike for Climate, and it's it's been really great seeing so many people, so many numbers come out with such a strong force. But then at the same time, it's the next day. Do they care about the climate? You know, what are what are they doing in their daily lives to actually make a change other than go to protests? And um, I think that's really my goal and what I'm working on in my communities and with friends is to really sustain those efforts and to um, create like a longer lasting movement that isn't just strikes. So yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being um, invited uh, here today. I know I've got big font, that's all right. <laughs> um, and I guess I'd like to start by paying tribute to the, the school strikers whose extraordinary movement I think has really shifted politics all around the world, certainly um, in Australia, um, and really opened the way to have um, a broader discussion that is not only amongst schools, but has made a huge impression across society and is now really making an impact across the union movement as well. And I think one of the things, I know you were a bit, sounded like you were a bit frustrated about it, but the fact that ordinary students are, want to get involved with a strike, who may not want to be involved um, in the movement on a day-to-day -day basis, I think also tells us about the importance of that kind of action in involving the broad majority of people who might not see themselves as activists, but who do have some concern and do want that opportunity to show that concern in a forceful way that they can see really um, has a significant impact to the extent that you know it really pisses off the Prime Minister, Education Ministers, Andrew Bolt, all of these um, <laughs> conservatives who are doing their best 
stop any kind of, um, of climate action are really feeling the pressure of the actions um, of, of school <coughs> students as well. Um, so the topic today I've been asked to talk about is about the, the Green New Deal. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of discussions about this, probably originating in the United States um, with the motion that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez put um, up to the House of Congress that's got a phenomenal, if you actually look it up, it's an extraordinary number of um, Congress, Congress members and senators who've signed their name to support what is a very radical uh, program of action. Um, that's now spread to Canada, where there's a Green New Deal, uh, a Pact for Green New Deal Alliance. Um, that's a bit more of a movement-based thing, where they're, um, they've got a campaign, they're having town hall meetings across Canada and pushing for a broader discussion and consultation process to bring people in. There's been very significant discussions about this in the UK as well, and the Labour Party has adopted a kind of platform of a green industrial revolution, but there's also people that are pushing for that also to be extended more um, into a Green New Deal um, as well. Um, the, so there's different kind of strategies that have happened in, in those different places. One of the key things about the American um, one is that it was uh, one of the drawbacks of it, unfortunately, was that it was launched very quickly by a small group of people, then put directly um, to the Congress, and what they're actually asking for, for it to be uh, properly planned and implemented, is for a committee of the Congress itself um, to do that, and very tightly timed around the electoral schedule um, of the United States as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something worth understanding and also learning from as well, that um, I think the Canadian approach is actually a better approach in terms of uh, the movement itself, um, figuring out what do people want, how do we build this movement, and not deferring that uh, to a committee of Congress or to an electoral schedule as well. There have been some discussions about um, what could something like a Green New Deal uh, in Australia look like as well. There's been a sort of smattering of I don't know, meetings and phone conferences around the place of, of people discussing that. Most people sort of agree that whatever it is, that's the wrong name. Um, but um, I think those discussions are something that we should welcome. And there's a few key reasons for this. Because I think a lot of it is actually, as somebody who, who works in the union movement, the main people who are asking me about what do you think about a Green New Deal are actually people who are either in the environmental movement or on the left in some way. And the reason that I think it's really significant is particularly because what it does signify is I think a big shift uh, within the environment, environmental movement to in, the, in terms of the kinds of politics that people are interested in talking about. So first of all, in terms of trying to deal with the climate crisis and inequality um, that we have together, to recognize that that is a massive problem and that actually the environmental movement needs to be part of finding that solution. I think that's a really big shift from talking about environmental issues in isolation from the social context um, that they're of course arising in. Um, in terms of the role of the state, of course the Green New Deal calls for massive government investment in new programs, new services, new systems, new infrastructure um, and that's a big shift from the environment movement talking about the market, market-based solutions as kind of the easiest and most politically palatable solutions. Um, the fact that they're talking about also, you know, it might not be sufficient, but they're also talking about improving employment, improving jobs. Again, that's another um, important shift. And of course, integrated into all Green New Deal discussions that I'm aware of is um, a focus on, on land rights. Um, and on the role of Aboriginal people in uh, rehabilitating the land um, because, of course, the land itself um, and restored and repaired ecosystems is an important source of uh, absorption um, of carbon from the atmosphere um, and a very significant um, thing <laughs> that we need to do to provide a habitable planet for all of us. And I think, finally, the fact that it's, it is a broad Whatever its limitations, it is a broad transformative vision. It's a big picture thing, which again is quite a departure from the kind of small target strategies the environment movement has been involved in. You know, which, um, despite the importance and the significance of the Stop Adani campaign, that is perhaps example, an example of that, where you just focus 
on one mine and all the pieces around from that Green New Deal is really talking about how are we going to improve and, and transform society. So again, like I said, we need to welcome and encourage all of these discussions because I think they do really form the basis of what could be a class conscious um, environment movement, which I think is the fundamental thing that we're lacking here in Australia and that we urgently need to build. Um, and there has been, I think, a lot of this uh, kind of light bulb movement on the part of the environment movement, at least in Australia, has been really provoked by the results um, of the election that were, I think, a huge wake up call for people in terms of the fact that we actually do need to get the broad majority of society on board if we are actually going to be able to transform our economy and transform our society to one that's based on much lower emissions, carbon greenhouse gas emissions, than it is now. Um, so if we're talking about um, a class conscious environment movement, uh, a workers' climate movement, something like that, um, we need to be clear also about what we mean by that. Um, certainly, if we're thinking about it and discussing it um, as socialists. So, first of all, um, I think there is a very widespread recognition um, that the current climate crisis is caused by capitalism. Uh, I think that's not something, you, an understanding that's not unique to socialists at the moment. I think it's very widespread and probably something that's quite commonly discussed in Extinction Rebellion things, uh, events. Um, and of course, the central dynamics around that are around the drive for endless profit, the drive for endless expansion, the resources that are consumed in that, uh, the way our lives kind of all shaped uh, um, around that. But I think the key thing that we can contribute to that discussion as socialists um, is the class divisions uh, within capitalism. The fact that capitalism is based on the alienation of our labor, the fact that we all have to work to survive, um, and we have no choice or influence in terms of what those jobs are, what those options are available for the work that it's done. That is decided by a tiny minority of people who set the priorities, but who actually don't even get to decide that themselves because it's based on a chaotic system of competition where they're all in competition with each other, um, trying to you know, maximize those profits and keep things and keep things going. And the key link, the key ecological aspect of that is that the fact that our labor is alienated from us, our labor is actually the basis of our metabolism of the earth. That was actually how Karl Marx described it. He said, you know, labor is a metabolism between humans and the world around them. It's how we interact with the earth around us. It's how we keep ourselves ourselves going on an individual and on a broader social basis. So when we're alienated from our labor, we're actually also totally alienated from our relationship to the world around us. We have, you know, all around us are things, everything in this room is something that's been made out of the, out of the natural environment, but um, we're not actually in control of how those processes work. Um, uh, so I think the other thing that that points to is not just the problems with capitalism, but also uh, the potential solutions to that. Um, the fact that um, the fact that actually taking democratic control of how things are produced um, actually involves <laughs> the people who are involved in producing those things. Actually, having how our production systems, our transport, our infrastructure organized on not only a better social basis, but on a basis that's uh, in accordance with uh, ecological priorities and what science is telling us actually requires us to have democratic control over those systems, which we do not have um, at the moment. Um, so we actually need, we do need a revolutionary transformation of our society to be able to achieve that, um, and we need uh, workers to be an essential part of that movement because those are the people who are actually you know at the center of, of doing all these things of making these goods but who also form the majority of people in society and also have uh, the power to actually stop um, things to actually to go on strike to really wield political power on a broad uh, and significant basis 
um, that we need in order to build the power um, of the movement that we'll need. Um, and I'd say just as perhaps there's been some incredibly inspiring things that have come out of the Extinction Rebellion movement, but I think perhaps that's um, one thing we might say to people within the Extinction Rebellion. There is a bit of a focus there on uh, that we only need the 3.5% of people to do the civil disobedience. It's fantastic if we can get 3.5% of people committed to civil disobedience, but we do actually need everyone else as well to build um, the movement we need if we are uh, I think going to have the power to win and the power to win that kind of transformative change. Um, in terms of, now I'm not actually saying that we necessarily, you know, we can't deal, I think we probably can reduce carbon emissions if we have within, to, to, to I don't know, some extent, it's all a bit of a guess, within capitalism, if we can build a strong movement. But I think the thing that we have to recognize is that even if we can significantly reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions within capitalism, there are so many other interlocking ecological problems that we're faced with at the moment, and it's actually solving all of those ecological problems that will take um, revolutionary change. Um, so back to the Green New Deal. I mentioned at the beginning um, lots of environmentalists coming to people in the union movement and saying, so, what do you think about a Green New Deal as their kind of light bulb moment? How do we incorporate inequality, public investment, all of those things? And so I think actually the more, and that's a great question to be asked, but I think actually the more immediate questions that we need to be asked um, is how do we build a class conscious environment movement? How do we build a workers climate movement? And the things that we need for that are not, there's a bit of a tendency with Green New Deal campaigners to write a really long, fantastic manifesto, um, uh, which are useful for thinking about, but I think the key things that we need now are some practical joint campaigning. And there's been some great first steps to that. Um, first of all, certainly in union support uh, for the climate strike. Now, that actually happened because um, there's a tiny little environmental NGO called Tipping Point um, that's been supporting the climate strikers. And people within Tipping Point, I think, made in about February of last year, made a really quite concerted decision that they wanted to solicit support for the climate strike. And they did that very systematically, um, mainly with sort of national offices of unions. But um, I think that was a significant decision they made. Um, and it's been really good, and it's something that we're continuing to build on. Um, Climate strikers, after, after the election, decided that their three main demands that they had gone with before around um, stop Adani, no new, coil, uh, no new fossil fuel developments, or something along those lines, um, and 100% uh, renewable energy actually weren't enough. So they've been having uh, a long discussion now that hopefully has been finalized on Friday, I haven't heard quite what the outcome is, about adding another demand about the importance of a just transition, the importance um, of jobs, people's jobs in that just transition as well. So uh, hopefully next week we'll get to hear a little bit more about those details and they'll start putting out their official materials with that as well. And that's fantastic, that's fantastic that they're really putting that as one of the, I think they're, they're combining the no new fossil fuels stop Adani, then will be the renewable energy demand, and then as their third main demand will be around a just transition and jobs, so that's fantastic. Um, you might have heard recently that um, uh, the MUA members at DP World have been in a big, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enterprise bargaining uh, negotiation that's going on. Workers went on strike, the company then said it wanted to sack 200 people outsource a whole bunch of jobs, so it kind of really escalated quite significantly. And in the midst of that, actually, uh, before the MUA had sent out any requests for solidarity, the climate strikers who be, we'd been working with rung up and said, right, what can we do for solidarity? And the very next day, uh, the MUA had a letter from them, uh, climate, School Strike for Climate put up a solidarity statement on their main public Facebook page. Um, saying, you know, they asked, saying, you know, is this, are we treading on toes? Are we like, well, no, no skin off. <laughs> We'd be delighted. It's only you that's going to kind of get a bit of flack for um, supporting this. 
Um, and then later, uh, climate strikers and people from Friends of the Earth in Melbourne went down to a picket line uh, at, that was at DP World um, as part of that dispute as well and spoke at that picket line um, as well. Charlie Wood from, uh, from Tipping Point, Friends of the Earth, and who's also been involved with supporting the climate strikers, made what I've heard is a great speech down at that picket line as well. Um, and just last week, we saw a whole number of environmental movements issue a statement um, opposing the Ensuring Integrity Bill that really very significantly attacks unionists, um, basically saying we need more, if we're going to have a just transition, we need more union rights, we need more union power, um, not less. Um, and that by attacking union rights, we're really significantly undermining the potential for a transition as well. So those, I think, are all great signs that there are, we are starting to see um, some significant shifts as well. Um, we do also need a politics that's also um, genuinely inclusive of working class concerns as well. So uh, that comes, I think, down to public ownership of electricity, renewable energy, yes, but I do think we will need public ownership of our, uh, of our grid, of our generation system to, in order to actually get to 100% renewable energy. It's, the more you look into our electricity system, it's quite astonishing that we do manage to have lights on. It's so chopped <laughs> up into so many different systems. It needs to be completely rebuilt in order to cope with renewable energy. Government agencies are starting to acknowledge that now, and there is an integrated system plan that's been developed by the Australian electricity market operator, but it's very unclear who, like, who is actually going to build this, who is going to make this plan come into effect. Um, so there's some real problems there. We need um, to be talking about jobs in low emissions in industries, whether you talk about green jobs, climate jobs, uh, renewable energy jobs, other land rehabilitation, ecosystem repair jobs, public transport, uh, building more infrastructure, um, new kinds of manufacturing, all of those things. Um, and we also need campaigns to improve uh, working uh, conditions in renewable energy, which actually are quite bad at the moment, um, very unfortunately. And that's, uh, that's something that's only developed very recently, just with the big, really in the past year, there has been an enormous building boom um, in renewable energy, but it's been on the basis of short-term casual work, uh, often not unionized, very poor wages and conditions. And particularly in Queensland, many of these projects are being built in mining communities, and miners are looking at it and saying, mm, no thanks. <laughs> so with, you know, with very uh, good reason, unfortunately. So there's a huge space there to improve that. Um, so I started talking about the fact, uh, the role that the climate strike has played um, in shifting politics in Australia. Um, of course, we've got another climate strike coming up on the 20th of September. Um, They've changed the name. It's not a school climate strike. It's a climate strike mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, they've asked for adults to participate. They've asked for unions to participate. Uh, and I think we all need to take this opportunity and really throw ourselves into organizing it for it as best we can. Uh, we have had a significant number of um, union endorsements already from the NTU, the MUA, the ASU on a national level. I suspect. NUW and United Voice will, but they're a bit kind of distracted with their merger negotiations at the moment, but also from some state branches as well. Um, the New South Wales Construction in general, the AEU in Victoria, the PSA in New South Wales, uh, and there's probably lots of others on that list that I'm, um, that I'm missing as well. Um, now, I think one of the key things is we need to just not look at that, that list as a kind of list of, I don't know, off people in offices deciding they're going to, you know, issue a Facebook meme, but actually how are we going to get um, people, humans, um, involved in participating um, in this strike on the day in whatever means that they can. Obviously that's going to depend a lot depending on what sort of workplace that you're in as well. So we've been trying to... Um, develop that, that participation. There are meetings happening every two weeks at the MUA union rooms. The next one is this Wednesday at, um, at 6 o'clock. 
welcome anybody, uh, especially if you're a unionist, but also if you're a climate striker um, from the school, <laughs> to, to come and be involved with that discussion, basically just trying to um, support people's efforts to organize for the climate strike in their unions and in their workplaces as well. Um, and we're going to be having, that body's going to, the last meeting we decided we have a forum on the 31st of August, uh, probably the venue's not confirmed, it'll probably be at Unions New South Wales. Uh, that's a Saturday, uh, Saturday afternoon thing. Hopefully we'll get people um, along from the, from the ETU to talk about the importance of public ownership of electricity um, and from some other unions as well to talk about what, what practical steps, to talk about both the political demands that we need for workers' climate movement, but also what are some of the examples of practical organizing that people are doing as well. Um, so that's it. Thanks very much again and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the two presentations. They, they're really, really... Um, like the great way of introducing some of the topics I just wanted to address in terms of how we can really make the just transition into an eco-socialist movement. The last thing we really want is to go through a, a, position, a process of, of a just transition or to hear all of the demands put up in regards to that and actually end up with another version of green capitalism. End up with, with, a system, with, 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 with an approach to actually trying to save the climate, trying to save the planet, that actually is all about reinforcing the capital system. So just trying to sort of like think through, based on my experiences of having gone through an unsuccessful transition, in, in the Newcastle Steelworks. What are the lessons of, of that sort of experience and how we can take that into the situation that we're really facing at the moment with the, with the, climate, with the climate situation? The Green New Deal of Alexander Ocasio-Cortez that was introduced, gee, just less than a year ago, and, and, the, and the climate student strikers this past year have really, I think, you know, shown that we can be actually looking at a strategy that can win. If we've got 12 years to save the planet, 11 years to save the planet, what are the sort of political demands that the working class movement, that the socialist movement needs to be putting up that can actually help us really win on this issue and, as I say, not become a question of, of, green, of green capitalism. And look, and I think fundamentally, you know, the demand that we really need to be looking at is the question of the nationalisation, and I really agree with the comments about the power industry, but I'm thinking, really, at this critical stage, the whole of the fossil fuel industry in this country, coal mining, gas production, needs to be under public ownership and control. Call that what you like. Call that what you like. I call it nationalisation, but we have to be really thinking through, whatever it's called, the important thing is that we bring oil, gas production, coal mining under public hands. That is really the way in which you can guarantee that we can save the planet in this short time. And so if we, if we have that expectation that we've got 11 or 12 years, there are going to be massive <coughs> shifts in what's happening in the, in the environment, in our economies, and also amongst the consciousness of working people. How can we actually use a demand like nationalisation, whatever way we wish to frame it, that actually starts to become more than just an abstract demand that you know, the left used to put up on a ritualistic basis, but something that actually has meaning and can actually win the support of working people. And in this divide between environmentalism, jobs, or to be for the environment is to be against jobs. We have to really look at ways to break that down. We really have to have a plan that can be seen as convincing to those 20% of workers and working people in the Hunter region, for example, recently, who voted for One Nation in basically a coal mining district. We have to be able to, in a situation, we put, a, put forward demands, a realistic political and economic program that can win over those workers in North Queensland. That might be tempted or are tempted to vote for that fellow with the, the big hat. I don't even want to remember his name. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the racist, misogynistic, climate denying sections of the, of the, of the ruling class that would love to sow divisions among working people and build on the divide and separate workers from the environment movement, separate workers from, from the high school students. And you know the really and the high school student strikes, extinction rebellion, the Green New Deal, that just happened in the last twelve months, really started to expose so that 
It's an indication of the future changes that we could be com- yeah, that could very make very well be coming down the line that we take advantage of. So you look at well, how do we do this? I mean, I put forward, I'm just going to put forward a few scenarios. So I'm not saying I'm, I'm not favouring one or another, but just paint a bit of a picture on, on how this might unfold. We're missing out on 90. We've missed out on 90 billion dollars by not having a resources tax in this country. 90 billion dollars. Ever since the Gillard government ditched what Rudd was trying to put forward, as limited that was, we've not really had a resources tax. People, the, the capitalist class, the 1%, are totally ripping off the resources of this country. Australia has one of the lowest rates of taxation on the exploitation of our fossil fuel resources in the world. So if we put forward a demand where we're actually due to the climate emergency, we need to put the coal and oil industry under public control, nationalise it, then we have a chance of actually raising the money to fund the transition that we're talking about. That starts to make it all look realistic to working people. If we have that $90 billion, if we reintroduce a resources tax, we start to raise the money. The way we can actually, whatever, we buy it out, we expropriate it, we tax it out of existence, whatever way, as long as we end up with the result. Personally, I prefer nationalisation without compensation, but you know, we, have, we do have to face with political realities, and Give if it needs to be that we actually achieve it by taking advantage of splits that are likely to happen within the ruling class, splits within the 1%, then you know, maybe that's part of the way in which we have a strategy that goes forward and we take advantage. Because if you look at the ruling class in this country, you know I mean, obviously at the moment, I think it's something like 40 to 50% of the Australian stock exchange, ex- the Australian stock exchange capitalisation is tied up with fossil fuel companies. Yes, you know. But also, there's 50% that isn't. You know, you have tourism. You have the banking industry. You have the insurance industry that are starting to get very nervous about this whole thing of the of the incessant of the of the resource extraction of the total economic and environmental destruction that is happening through into mining communities in the upper hundred. If you go up there, you'll see that. So, you know, there are you know, there are there are maybe political opportunities. What happens when the ruling class splits? Splits. <laughs> the stats and spits. That's where we have opportunity. Oftentimes, because it often leads to a political crisis, a crisis of which way to actually go. We have to be aware to situations where, where the opportunity arises, we drive forward with demands that can really make a difference. And nationalisation of the coal, of the oil industries, are, are key to that. If you look through here, if you look through history, it's really... To me, my way of thinking, it's when the ruling class is indecisive, it doesn't know which way to go because it has completing interest in it, that's when the left can really, if we go forward. Well, to me, that's really a fundamental <coughs> lesson of, of Leninism because it actually means that when you have your chance, when you see that political crisis, it enables you to win a majority and then when you have that majority, take the demand forward. And we need, to sit, need a situation where we have a political crisis that may be coming in the next five to ten years because of that impending collapse of ecosystems. There's bound to be a situation where the political crisis, but we need to be in it. We need to have our independent demands. It just doesn't like it back to green capitalism, or is it limited to green capitalism? And also in a situation where we're not where the climate, m- climate demands and the idea of a just transition isn't mediated by self-appointed um, leaders of the, of, the, of the environment movement or even of the trade union movement, but of the democratic participation and winning a majority of people in this country to actually take forward the sort of demands. So uh, nationalisation <coughs> of the coal industry would also give us a situation, as I said, we would have the opportunity to fund the transition but the first thing we'll do, of course, is we're actually looking at a phase out. Nobody says we're going to stop coal mining tomorrow. No, we talk about it in the context of a phase out. But in phasing it out, what are we actually doing? We're cutting production. What happened when they cut production? What happened when the uh, OPEC countries, on Hugo Chavez and, and Saudi Arabia, I think it was, in about 2008, reduced oil production? Prices went through the roof. So we have a situation where the prices may very well go through the roof in, in, in the for coal, right, which can actually benefit the transitional production that's still happening in coal. You know, if revenue goes up, more money for the transition, and also drive an imperative 
towards the sort of plans that have been well articulated by Beyond Zero Emissions uh, and, and various documents, you know, putting forward alternative strategy for how we can actually be powering and resourcing and manufacturing in the country, such as weathering the storm, the case for transforming the Hunter Valley. Uh, there's another one here that I put out by the CFMEU, that I, just the document that I have. Um, you see. Rua or Appalachia, put up by the CFMEU. <laughs> it's mostly specified about coal mines related to electricity production. CFMEU, of course, still supporting export of coal. Um, and that it really address phasing out the export of coal in, in this document. But you know, this compares transition methods and looks like works, looks like what it looks at what works around the country. And also funded by the CFMU and also a, a very interesting document for the what things that they say. And of course, you know, the, the Beyond Zero Emissions who have done various strategies about how within 10 years Australia could repower and retool the country through solar panels, wind farms and, and, and clusters of those around, around the country. So there are, there are strategies. So by reducing production of coal, we're also driving an economic set by making coal costs more high, higher great export revenue in a sense, not that I'm trying to speak at it from a capitalist perspective, but also creating an imperative and making it much more cost efficient for solar, wind, and those, um, those alternative forms of power. So what we're doing there, we have a situation where taking that split, and, and we see that sort of like split reflected, in, in, you see it in Newcastle, where there's a um, where the even, the even the even the person who is the chair of the Hunter Port Corporation, which was privatised, was in public hands, privatised. Ninety percent of the coal that it goes through, most, no, no, ninety percent of what goes through Newcastle Port is coal. But even the chair of the Port Corporation could see, hey, this isn't a good economic future for us. We need to be diversifying. <laughs> so it's just. Um, Recognition by some sections of the of the ruling class that that's what they need to be doing. Obviously, there's a, a bit of a division there. And one of the things that they're talking about in the Hunter region is is um, production of um, of hydrogen, for example. And so there's yeah there are there are divisions within the ruling class that that's the way to go through. We nearly need to be taking advantage of those and driving forward that particular demand. The whole of, of nationalisation, because also look at it in the context. Privatisation is shown to not work. I mean, we only have to look at what's happening in the building industry in New South Wales at the moment with the certifiers, the certification. I mean, how insane is that? So that's a good example of uh, anybody catching a train in Sydney or public transport in Sydney or Newcastle in recent times knows that, you know, um, rain comes down, trains stop working. Obviously, the, and, that, and that's under a system that's increasingly moving towards privatisation. So privatisation is becoming more and more on the nose and creates us for the opportunity to say, well, if they're not capable of running these sort of services, why should we be trusting the capitalist class? Why should we be trusting the 1% with the production of what is fundamentally a very important resource? And we shouldn't be using coal to burn. We should be using coal to making medicines for, and for guaranteeing the health of, of, of future generations and using what, what they are, complex complex organic compounds that have a lot better uses than just, than just the burning. <coughs> now, look, I just wanted to come, and until so I started to finish off, I started off on Newcastle. <coughs> what was the lesson of Newcastle? When I started there in 1979, we had 11,300 workers. 11,300 workers. In 1982, all of a sudden, it was steel boom. Just in a matter of months, went to steel crisis. And then the, the, the layoffs started to come in 1982, and the writing started to be on the wall for the Newcastle Steelworks. So what a bunch of us comrades at the time, and you know, a, a bunch of rank and file workers, we ended up getting 20% of the vote when we ran in the union elections shortly afterwards, but we really put forward that demand that we had to nationalise the steel industry. And we put it forward quite strongly in Newcastle, but there was a, a big pushback. We didn't quite understand where the pushback was coming from, except of course it was the Labour Party because it was just before Hawke was getting elected and what then no way were they going to tolerate a bunch of militant workers saying, hey, and actually a motion calling for the nationalisation of Port Canvas Steelworks was actually passed uh, in Wollongong. 
Um, and when I moved to Simla Motion at a mass delegates meeting of about 400 construction workers, wharfies and, 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 and steel workers in Newcastle, it went down. Uh, but there was a lot of nervousness, we subsequently found out, from the union bureaucracy that this motion actually could have gone up in Newcastle. Mm. It would have created a big embarrassment because the Labor Party was hell-bent on the direction of the accord, class collaboration, rather than in a situation where we're going to expropriate and take over the 1% to actually run this steel industry for common good, to build, as we said at this time, to use the steel to build the schools and the hospitals and all the infrastructure that we needed to be getting out of the, of, of the recession that was, that was um, then looming. So we, we, you know, we, we put it... And what, so what we said, if we don't implement a strategy like this, we will not survive 15 years after the Steelworks closure was announced. And all those years... And when they closed in 1999, we were producing more steel with 3,000 workers than what had been produced with 11,300 20 years before. Massive increase in productivity. So it's not just a question of productivity. Ah, oh, we need productivity to create jobs. Lies. <laughs> no, you know, they just really want profits. So that's what we say. If we don't have a plan, if we don't have a plan to actually take over the steel industry, our jobs in the long run are doomed, and unfortunately, we were right. And it's even worse than that, because we still have an empty space here, still have an empty paddock where the steelworks used to be. Where was the planning? Where was the transition? And my concern is, if we just leave it to talk of Green New Deal, as great as that is, as, and, and as much potential as I like, and I really like the dynamism, the discussion, the debate that is put forward, if we just leave it to that, we will be left out again. We will be left with the same sort of situation, the same Newcastle scenario, the same car industry scenario, where plenty of warning was there, but nothing was done, and workers were just left to the hang the consequences. So that's why I think it's, it's really important that we... Keep that in mind, that the transition, and, and workers know that experience. If you're in North Queensland, then why would you want to go through the experience of the Newcastle Steelworks or, 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 the, uh, or the car industry in this country? We need really to have a viable program, something that is coherent and sticks together and doesn't say, you know, as was rightly pointed out, well, who'd want to go and work in some, you know, crappy job, working casual hours and getting paid under award rates just because it's renewables. Well, you know, that's not really attractive. We need things that are attractive, but we do need to be able to have the capacity to finance it. And finance it by a resources tax that taxes them out of existence <laughs> or by expropriation because we actually have the political will and we have a creative political crisis where we can actually force that through and exploit any division that may occur in the, working, in the ruling class to take it forward and win public demand on the, based on the, maybe on the backs of the revulsion towards the failures of privatisation, we can actually, I think, put forward an alternative strategy to actually win working people over. Because there are strong traditions in the working class movement of social justice, of supporting social causes. I mentioned that in Wollonga, the motion for the nationalisation of the steel industry was passed at, at, a, at a mass delegate uh, meeting of workers. It used to be nationalisation of the... supporting the nationalisation of the means of production, industry and exchange <laughs> is still, I think, but in rerun form, on the tickets for Labour Party members. <laughs> it used to be such a very popular demand and we need to resuscitate, revive that demand which is very popular in the labour movement. Part of the problem that we have in the labour movement is we don't have the vision thing. We've lost the vision thing. We don't really, people don't see the direction. It's all about union shopper. It's, it's all about, you know, the next enterprise bargaining agreement. You know, the union movement needs, you know, that vision of a, of, of a better society. Uh, of, 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 of a vision where we put socialism on the union banners, as we used to see. So we need to have this kind of like demand that, that takes us forward, that can actually have the capacity of giving hope, of inspiring people, and also providing practical examples because we have the money, because we've taken it, uh, acquired it from the, from the coal industry there. The resources tax, $90 billion. How much are they trying to raise to get the Adani mine to go? You know, to, 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 get, the, to get the Adani mine built. So there is, there is the money there. 
And I'd also just, you know, say that unions like the CFMEU and in some of its previous iterations, such as the Builders Labourers Federation, saved my community in Newcastle where I live. They saved parts of Sydney. That because of, the, of that implementation of, of a social conscious. And we go back to the waterfront workers and, and what they did. I the, oh no, recently heard the, um, the Illawarra uh, Trade Labour Council Secretary talk again about the, uh, about the, uh, the wonderful uh, experience of, of, of the solidarity with, with Chinese workers in the, um, in the 1930s when they, when they refused to, to, to send um, iron ore to, to, be, um, to be used to create bombs to, to drop on. China. So there are wonderful examples of the working class movement actually taking on progressive courses. We can win over working class people to these sort of ideas. Because I think about it, when I think back to what we, in those early years in the 80s when we are working in the steel industry, you know, whether what we know, if a different campaign could not could have taken things in a different direction. What did we want? In 1981 we had one massive 20% pay rises right across many industrial sectors. There was a huge wage explosion. We also had, uh, we also won the 30-hour week in those years too, in the steel industry and other industries that are around the country. And one thing I'm particularly proud of, what we'd also done in the Newcastle Steelworks, is we'd actually won the right for women to work at that industry. So it gives an indication that working people can be won. Hey, you know, those workers in Cessnock, those workers in, you know, North Queensland, hey, as we know, you know, sometimes we can lose sight the ordinary people, just like us, you know, do the same things, you know, play darts on Friday nights and, you know, what net, watch Netflix on Saturday nights and, you know, involved in the baseball club, involved in netball, go to kids. So, you know, it's, it's not as if they want to see the planet destroyed, you know, it's, it's none of that. But at the same time, you know, people need to have a, a convincing argument, you know, a convincing narrative that says, yep, yeah, yeah, this is something that is actually, you know, uh, work, worth about, you know, worth you know, considering if, you know, to, to, to take on board a transition. Look, and if it means that we pay off workers in North Queensland and give them a million dollars to resettle or, you know, retire or, you know, whatever, moving out of an industry, that has to be, you know, has to be attractive. That has to be something that's, that's saleable. And moves across from this thing of creating a distinction between jobs and the environment. We can have both, you know. We can have the sort of economic development which is just, which is based upon transition, which is based upon saving the planet, which is based upon social justice, cooperation and, and, and working together, rather than, you know, this dog-eat-dog, -dog, hell the planet, planet can go to hell. No, there's a different way forward and we have to really think about popularising demands that mm -hmm. can take us forward. Thank you. Steve posthumously, which is um, that Steve is a member of social. He's still alive. Not <laughs> quite yet. Post, post his speech. Not right. Yeah. <laughs> um, former steel worker, now educator. He also did a PhD on revolutionary posters within Latin America. So you can ask him about that um, in the break. And he's an organizer of social science in, the, in Newcastle. So thanks very much, Steve. That was talks, um, really heartening and invigorating and full of detail um, and multi-generational, so very good. Um, we'll open it up for questions, I don't know all of your names, so but we'll take three and then we might go back to the panel and we'll, we'll keep going until 11.30. So we've got lots of time and no question is a bad question, um, so throw in and who wants to kick off? We're all ruminating. Um, actually, all right, while, while you're ruminating. I'll have all your details later so I can connect you up with my wife at 3CR. That, that's my question. That's yeah, good. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, um, what's the essential role of social science and what are the and in Sydney and, and in the high school student movement around this question of um, workers coming out and striking? What's the, what's the sentiment both within the teachers and the unions um, that comrades are involved in? Um, and also, um, Parker, what's the assessment of the system within the student strikers? Is there discussion around capitalism? Is there discussion about revolution? 
And yeah, certainly when I was a high school student activist, when you used the C word, you had to really explain what capitalism was. Um, is there a lot more of an awareness now? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, School Strike has really brought um, the idea of, of capitalism to teenagers and students who didn't really know a lot about it beforehand. Um, I know that whenever I talk to people, I really am trying to educate them on capitalism and its detrimental effects. Um, and about what you said before that, I think teachers would really love to go on strike, a lot of them. Um, I know that in public schools there's a lot of support, you know, like teachers will take a whole class and they treat it as like an excursion, but I think in more <coughs> private schools um, it's very difficult for teachers to go on strike. But I think if they had that opportunity, they definitely would take it. And in the school strike movement there is often a lot of discussion on capitalism. I don't think not so much on revolution. Um, I mean, I would like there to be more discussion on revolution because that's really what I think uh, we need. Um, but yeah, I would really like to bring that idea to them a lot more than has been discussed before. Can I just like, add? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll actually just take uh, two more if that's all right and then we'll throw it to the panel as a whole. So I've got Peter and I've got Ariel. Yeah, I just I thought it was interesting. Steve's raised the question of, uh, you know, we have to exploit divisions in the ruling class. But I think one of the things that is a bit of a reality check for us in Australia is that um, is when you think what what vested interests are we really up against, you know? And you think, okay, there's everyone's familiar with the idea of stranded assets, right? So you say, oh, all these people who've sort of bought into coal assets in the Carmichael in a Gallaty Basin, they're really, you know, they've got a strategy of trying to get the government to bail out their stranded assets because they're really not, you know, economically viable. So that makes it sound like these fossil fuels are, you know, are like a small and battle minority. But in actual fact, they're not. Because the, tr the problem is that, you know, we're living in a, in a stage of capitalism where everything is financialized, is tied up with the finance sector. So that sector that you mentioned, the finance sector, is not apart from the fossil fuel sector. In fact, they're totally integrated. In fact, of all the different areas of investment, resource investment is probably one of the most highly leveraged. That means it's borrowed money. And that means when you're looking at a resource company, you're not looking at a resource, a miner, you're looking at an entire conglomerate of financing. So you could say that all these banks and all these finance sectors, they have a stake in rescuing these stranded assets. And that's the problem. The problem is that actually in the capitalist class in Australia, the people who are not invested in these stranded assets are probably a minority at this stage. And which is why you, you don't hear the loud voice. You know, you even talk about Great Barrier Reef and you think there'd be a lot more screaming about what's it going to do to the, to, to, to the tourism. You can barely hear a squeak from the capitalist sector. Uh, and I think that's what it reflects. So I think that's one of our problems here is that I have no doubt the crisis will come. There'll be an opportunity. But I think we're up against quite a big block of vested capitalist interests, uh, um, you know, tied up with fossil fuels. If not coal, certainly gas. Because, you know, you heard that we've become the... We've outstripped Qatar as the producer of gas. You know, like, we're up there. We're like Saudi Arabia. You know, that's, that's the reality. We're not getting any revenue. Oh, thanks, Peter. Mm. Uh, we'll go for Ariel. Yeah. Well, hard to follow that. Uh, just a quick one on um, perhaps creating a crisis in the Catholic Church. Uh, you, 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 mentioned, uh, <laughs> uh, you mentioned the teachers uh, or, or the administrators of the, of the schools not wanting the students to go out on strike. Um, would the students like to carry copies of Laudato Si, the Pope's document, which is highly favourable towards all environmental issues, critical issues at the moment? 
That's a very good idea. <laughs> Pope right, says, we'll, we'll head strike. To the panel. Um, I'll head to the panel and I see some more hands up, so we've got lots of time, don't worry. We'll get you. Penny, Parker, Steve, which one? Um, well, just in terms of um, in terms of Newcastle um, and the transition in, in Newcastle, I completely agree with what Steve's said about um, the need that we actually need to have credible, feasible plans that people believe and, and can understand. So the two things that the Maritime Union is working on there, first is trying to get a container terminal um, established there. Um, and some of you might be aware that that's actually been blocked by the privatization process that was undertaken by the New South Wales Liberal government. Um, there were uh, basically in the privatization process, there were agreements that were signed that basically mean that the port of Newcastle has to pay the New South Wales government $100 for every single container that it handles over and above a certain limit, which is kind of more than the actual cost of handling the container. Um, so they've basically made it completely unfeasible. Now that's being, uh, the cha that, that is actually being led by the Port of Newcastle itself. It's in the federal court, ACCC, that whole realm of, of things, but that is something that the, the union is, is supporting as well. Um, the other thing that we've only just had a bit of a thought bubble about is the fact that uh, we do have very good, uh, strong wind resources off the coast. If you look at a map of the wind in New South Wales, um, the kind of the strongest winds you really get only on a few areas of land, sort of kind of mountain ridges and, and that kind of thing. But off the coast, all the wind is really strong. Most of our population lives off the coast as well. The challenge is that the water is quite deep. So people have kind of said, well, if you're going to have windmills there, um, they'd have to be really close to shore, probably unfeasibly close to shore. Um, the technological development that's happened just in the past year is there's actually there's been the development of floating windmills um, that can be used in water that's around 100 meters deep. Often the windmills, people like to build them sort of about 10, 20 miles offshore so that they're not like right in people's faces. That's also good for jobs as well. <laughs> it takes longer to get there um, in terms of doing the construction and maintenance. Um, so yes, so the possibility of actually using some of that empty land, um, sadly and tragically empty land that's around the port of Newcastle as a terminal for manufacturing um, and actually the staging the construction um, of um, of floating offshore wind terminals off the coast um, of New South Wales is another practical idea that we're exploring. Um, next week we've got meetings with some actual windmill experts over at UTS, so we'll be talking about that a bit more. Um, uh, in terms of workers actually striking, it's, I mean, we're only guessing at this point. I don't actually think we're going to be seeing a you know general strike on the 20th of September, but I think we will be seeing um, <coughs> lots more participation from workers, either, you know, in many cases, people taking uh, leave, people long taking lunch. a longer lunch, uh, if they work <laughs> if they, if they work close by, obviously, if they work farther away, it's a, that's a little bit more of a challenge. I think in universities, hopefully we can get a lot of staff participation, that's partly because of the pressure from the students as well, the pressure on chancellors um, to basically um, allow, and this happened last time, but only at very short notice, to basically give, say that nobody will be penalized for taking the day off. Uh, we've got much longer lead time now uh, to pressure for that to happen, and that's already underway in a lot of universities. I think there'll probably be other employers as well who will be pressured by their workers and also the general social conditions to basically, you know, give people, give people the day off. Um, the fact people actually having strikes on that day is obviously a bit of a more challenging proposition. Um, I don't, I don't know of any workplace now that's, you know, really that we could. I mean, I know of a few activists who would love to have a strike in the workplace. Um, actually, carrying that off and pulling that off with the majority of the workforce is a whole other very challenging practical question at this point. So, um, who knows? It would be fantastic if we could. Um, if we could get there. Um, in terms of your comment, uh, Peter, about the stranded assets, I mean, completely agree. It's, there, it is it's a huge and very practical question. Like you said, we're the largest coal, the largest LNG exporter in the world. So, I mean, it's no bloody small potatoes that we're dealing with 
here. Um, there has been a bit of a crisis in those industries that I think has led to a bit of an attack on wages and conditions, both in oil and gas, um, the price going down, and uh, in coal, um, the, a lot of the casualization of the workforce that's happened. But it does seem like there's actually, <laughs> crazily enough, a bit of an expansion going on right now. So certainly in the offshore oil and gas industry, work is picking up, more projects are, um, are being planned. Certainly there's been a whole number of, I haven't actually tracked coal mine approvals, so I don't know how common this is over time, but I knew certainly in the last six months there have been a whole number of new coal mines um, approved in Queensland and in, and in New South Wales, um, next to the Adana, you know, not far. <laughs> it's been quite strange watching this happen and barely being noticed. The other thing we're going to see is um, companies trying to, um, get these things to be marketed as renewables, basically either through using the old carbon capture and storage, right? It's important for people to know carbon capture and storage has not worked anywhere in the world yet. The best example we've got in Australia, the Gorgon gas project, actually its license for operation, it's up in Northwest WA, says that it must have carbon capture and storage to operate. Mm -hmm. Somehow, the plant has been in operation for something to like two or three years now, mm -hmm. exporting gas all over the world. Somehow, they just haven't got the carbon capture and storage to work, and that hasn't stopped their gas production. That hasn't caused the <laughs> West Australian government to, you know, clamp down and say, okay, <laughs> you've got to get it going. They're, they just say they're working on it. So, I think that's a good example to look to in terms of the kind of way that those arguments are used just to try and keep these projects rolling. Also, the coal and gas industry arguing for hydrogen to be produced from either coal or gas as well, calling it renewable if they can get the carbon capture and storage. So there's all of those murky arguments being put forward by the industry that we need to be on the lookout for. Thanks, Penny. Parker and Steve, do you want to have a go? If not, that's all right. No, um, I, 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 well, part of this is fine. Well, I mean, I don't know much about assets. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's fine. I, I, I just come here. I, I agree with Peter's comments. I, I did, um, did mention you know, something like half of the Australian stock exchange is actually capitalised with, with fossil fuels. So, um, and as for yeah, and. It may well be 80%, you know, that's directly related if we look at the whole question of, um, of interrelationships. But if, if we look at, I mean, did I notice in the paper this morning, I noticed on one of my news feeds, you know, somebody warning about the danger of an Enron-style collapse of Australian banking. Um, the Australian banking industry isn't through its crisis, you know, just because we had a Royal Commission and some recommendations were made. Um, so, you know... Where a whole lot of the uh, where, where the banking industry collapses, and we've seen that before, and they're basically rescued by the government. I mean, and certainly in the United States, in effect, a lot of the banks were in, were in effect nationalised and then given back. So therein, you know, perhaps if that crisis does occur, if what well, when that crisis occur, and, and we have a huge um, a huge problem in the banking industry, and if we look at what's happened in the past that may very well happen in the future, especially with the situation with the property market, that actually might create an opportunity for us to, to, to take, over the, take over the banking industry because it hasn't worked. So I restricted myself to saying the nationalisation of, of the coal industry and yes, uh, the That's enough to go oil, on with. sorry? That's enough to go on with? It's, <laughs> right on there. It's, it would create a dynamic, just like the Green New Deal. It would create a dynamic that would would, would lead lead to lead to other places. I mean, that's the whole thing about this. It, it doesn't kind of like stop. It actually it has implications. But it's something that I was also trying to frame it in terms of you know how do we how do we popularise an idea that's sort of like oh, you know that's that terrible. That would be so communistic. But looking at looking at you know the revulsion of privatisation and, and looking at certain historical traditions in Australia that we can and, and and the way in which we frame it you know is it is it a climate emergency you know does that create us the conditions on which we might be able to uh, you know, declare that uh, we need to, to move against the uh, move against the, the big economic powers big economic powers in that way if there is that political space 
it won't be there for long, and when it does occur, that's when we actually have to be ready to move to, to, to raise a demand like that. On, on the workers in the, uh, and, and the September 20, be fantastic. I know in Newcastle, the, um, the speaking platform and the um, um, uh, will be probably will be provided by. If past history indicates what will happen in the future, we'll provide up 100 workers so, so that Newcastle Labor, Labor Council will be supporting that. Maybe their truck will be covered in union, in, um, in student strike uh, posters and banners, but yeah, Newcastle Transport Council, you know, despite having a strong uh, mining section and, and despite having still like differences of opinions about the whole, um, you know, the whole climate debate, you know, there obviously there's some discussion. Um, that will be supporting the, uh, the action in, in Newcastle. Now, I know my union, the PSA, has, has, uh, has promoted it. And, and also, so the next 100 uh, workers meeting, we'll be having a uh, uh, delegate, in other words, a Hunter Region Trades Hall Council delegates meeting. We'll have uh, a speaker from the um, high school student uh, strikers. Um, so there's, there's a little bit happening in that space. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, contributors. We've got Luke. Jim and then Pip for the next round. Uh, Luke? Okay, uh, Pip mentioned about splitting the um, ruling class, but I think the uh, unfortunate it's been a lot of splitting the working class, <laughs> that's, that's their success. Uh, I remember in 1996 how sometimes CFMEU in Tasmania supported the Liberal Party, in, though not elsewhere. Uh, the mine the resources tax though did a very good job in the scare campaign in Queensland, rural Queensland, the small towns, how the last election, how there was a massive swing to uh, the various right wing organisations, including the Liberal Party, uh, away from the right wing organisation called the Labour Party. Uh, <laughs> but no, um, how they used it to split, how can we get uh, the workers to realise the small town folk, small uh, shop owners, etc., who think they rely on a Dani or um, Palmer to survive, how can we get them to realise it to change? Thanks, Luke. Um, actually, what I'm going to do, there's so much interest on, on the, from the floor. We'll take the six questions and comments, and if comments on the panel can write the questions down so they they um, then can respond if, if they, they do desire. So thanks, Luke. We've got then Jim, Pip, and Jonathan. Yeah, well, thanks to the speakers. Really interesting, actually, really good combination of different um, areas that you're coming from and speaking about. Um, the first thing I just wanted to just to tackle this question of the thorny question of capital, capitalist interests and, and how the current situation intercedes with, with the environment. Because I think we're going into a, I think we're having a confluence of two major crises. We're, we're going into a major international economic crisis. Yeah. The Trump administration has launched a trade war and a similar yeah. Uh, prelude occurred before World War One. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where this thing is going. Mm. But this guy, uh, not him person, not him solely personally, but partly personally, and all these mad advisors he's got. Um, where is this ending? They're, they're, they've actually launched a trade war on China. They're even talking about doing it on Russia. They, uh, I know this Trump even wants to launch a trade war against France over wine. So he's, he, I don't know what he'll hit Australia with, probably not. But um, there, there's a serious uh, possibility of a major economic rec uh, recession coming down the line, which is going to affect Australia. Um, and uh, this combines with what is, going, what is happening with the ecological crisis. We, we, so to me, we have got to have a vision that is not, is in fact, a combination of the capitalist economic crisis, economic political crisis, and the ecological crisis, because um, to, I think I don't know if it was Penny said, you know, that workers, that people um, sort of focused on uh, on climate change in a, in general, but how does it affect me, or how or that is the way you know very often people look at it in their own interest. So. You know, how are we going to combine these two things? Now, 
just a quick point on the fossil fuel industry. It's pretty clear to me that the coal industry, perhaps we should make a slight distinction between gas, which is now being presented as the fossil fuel of the future, or the present and the future, uh, oh yeah, we're going to phase out coal. The main thing with Adani and all these other mines, they want to dig it out quick because they know that it is a doomed industry for economic reasons and historical reasons and ecological reasons. So if it's there, quickly get, get it out and get it used and make the profit while you can. But the other side of it is Adani is bankrupt. I don't know how many people saw that article recently point going into detail about the finances of this thing. That, this guy is bankrupt, not only in Australia, but in India and in Africa, and all he is being propped up by governments. Complete total corruption in India. He's been completely propped up by the Modi government, and here he's looking to be propped up in Australia. He's going to create a stranded asset, and all these other projects that are coming online are pretty much the same, but they want to dig it out quick and get it out of the ground. So, We've got to create such a movement that it's it's sort of stopped, you know, in, in the short term. Even if we can't stop the rest of the, um, uh, you know, the rest of what's what's happening with gas and so on, so quickly. So yeah, I think that uh, the strategy and the vision thing has got to be to show to workers that in the environmental crisis and the economic crisis are not two separated things. The jobs and growth thing is not separated from the environmental crisis. Somehow these things are interlinked and that's where, you know, easier said than done and whatever terms we use, eco-socialism, putting uh, industry back in the hands of, 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 the pub, of public ownership and of course the next stage of course is not just public ownership but workers' control, workers and um, community control because otherwise you end up with a you know, what you had with Telstra at the end and Commonwealth Bank and so on. So, yeah, I think this question of the confluence of the two crises mm -hmm. has got to be right in the centre of our analysis and, and where we look for, um, you know, alternatives and, and demands. Thank you. Jim, we've got Piff and then Jonathan Reese, and I see Robin who just passed the FSU motion. Is, oh, so I'm going to put you on the list too, Robin. And then we, okay, cool. All right, we'll go from there. So yeah, thanks, Alan. Really interesting discussion, um, well, important um, eliminated discussion. I guess um, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about the role that the student, this new global student movement is playing in, in catapulting the emergency into beyond the silos, if you like, mm -hmm. beyond the already organised left or progressive movement, way beyond that. And I think perhaps the left has to catch up a little bit mm -hmm. on that. Um, you know, we're all bunkered down a little bit too much, I think, you know, can't really traditional, I don't know what it is, but you know, it's, you know, we know, we know um, that the left is, the organised left is way too small, especially the socialist left is way too small. Um, but I think, I think, I guess I feel pretty optimistic seeing, you know, considering the students have been organising really for what, just over a year, really, this isn't going to be the first global strike. Um, it's a new political element in the mix that I think we're still trying to take, uh, fully appreciate. Um, the very fact that most of the people that are spearheading this movement can't vote already immediately raises mm -hmm. the question of a new strategy. That is the non-electoral strategy, which is better for people like us who don't mm -hmm. give such great store to electoral strategies in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, not that we should discount it, but you know, it's not really a tool for the left in this country at the moment. Um, students also, regardless of the schools they're going to, public or private, you know, in the old days we used to call them the layer in transition, that is they're not sort of like, you know, necessarily their parents' class, if you like, they're still working out where they're going to be, class-wise, um, and, and they actually have, they, they can and they are, I think, showing that they're playing sort of a new and dynamic role in, in shaking this whole thing up. Of course, combined with all the other things going on, and the scientists, who would have ever thought climate scientists are playing a radical role, just simply by virtue of the fact that they're putting information out, and they're actually saying, oh, whoops, we got it wrong, we were really a bit conservative, and we put out all those previous things, 
So um, I guess my, I'm just trying to, I think, I think we're left with a sort of question for so much smoother and aggressive to this. Yeah, we're going to look at the, we're going to have to really assess the, 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 the September the um, Because I think we might see this move very fast afterwards. It's, it's going to be by far the biggest, blow, the, the only blow that I can climb with, I've seen in my life, Trump. Uh, I can't remember a previous one during the last big upsurge, the Vietnam upsurge, or the women's move, you know, that, the, the 60s and the 70s period. Even, you know, those those very big uh, movements that won significant demands, like the, you know, the, well, Franklin Dam, but, you know, before that, um, Bill's Labor's Federation running their campaign. I mean, you never saw, they had other corresponding things happening around the world, but you, you know, you didn't see, you didn't see this level of, 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 of breadth. I think. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is going to win it. I'm just saying that it's going to catapult. It is already catapulting it to a new level, and I'm not sure that we're set up. We, as in the broader we, are set up enough to to capitalise on that. Because I don't think we need to go to workers and say, look, you've got to worry about climate change. They're getting it from their kids, yeah. <laughs> you know? They're worrying about it in their own way, yes, of course. And of course we know that a lot of them are saying, well, you know, fuck that, I'm gonna vote One Nation because they're promising me jobs. We know all that. But I, 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 just, I just think that, you know, perhaps, you know, we're in a situation where things could move quite fast. We have to get ourselves better organised to take advantage of it. Otherwise, of course, you know, the One Nation people will. I mean, especially electorally, where Steve is in the Hunter. You know, you saw that happen. I mean, the One Nation guy just went out there and said, you know, I'm going to stick up for your jobs. I'm, he's a coal miner. I'm going to stick up for your jobs. He was a very cogent One Nation <laughs> person too, actually. Uh, unlike, um, you know, Pauline Hanson, um, that doesn't make sense half the time. But, you know, this guy was actually very clear about what he was, his message was getting out there. Okay, so you know that it's 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 socialism or barbarism in a way, you know, basically. <laughs> um, um, that's what Rosa Luxemburg had to realise. But I, I do think that you know, you know, we don't need to we don't need to sort of talk. We, we we've got to be careful too about not speaking a language that most people won't understand. I think there's a there's a there, the Green New Deal comes out of a certain sort of U.S. Canadian discussion that comes from a previous. Discussion around because Naomi Klein's um, manifesto, the leap, the leap manifesto. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's there's a history and tradition there, but it's it is easy. It should be easy for for us to to transliterate that to today's conditions, like you know, as Henry and Steve were talking about. Um, I just think we need to sort of outside this to get a lot better organised very very quickly to take advantage of, of what's going on, and I can see the build up to the climate. Strike is, is, is starting to prepare that sort of momentum. So, yeah. um, we've got Jonathan, Reese, Robin, Togs, and Zed. So, Jonathan, take it away. Yeah, um, thank you, Pam. Just a quick question, I guess. Um, it was mentioned that school administrations weren't happy with teachers or students being involved with the strike. What can they realistically do if, for example, a school students are wearing a school uniform to the strike and are speaking out as members of that school, I guess? And what kind of push back would be expected? Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, write some of the answers down and we'll hear from the panel later. Uh, Reese and Robin. Um, so, uh, I, this is... Yeah, I, I don't know what sort of question is going to fall out of this one, but I just I want to get people thinking about it because I don't really have an answer to it. We've just seen this um, this electoral defeat where the Liberal Party gained one seat. Going from a majority of one seat to a majority of two seats is not a cracking landslide, but I think conversely it is an indicator of the intense apathy and the lack of momentum that we're seeing in Australian politics at the moment, and it, it's sort of worrying to me. The, the Labor Party, I mean, the, the dead hand of the Labor Party hangs over the union movement. It is strangling it to death. Um, the, the organic momentum within the Labor Party really failed, uh, within the union movement, 
kind of bubbles up a little bit and then gets put back down by the by the Labour Party. And since the election, all we've seen is them swinging to the right under Albanese's mealy mouth um, sort of compromise agenda. The Greens are stuck in not all fact or all, all elements of the Greens. I must say there is some good work being done, especially here in New South Wales, but. Large, large parts of the Greens, especially at the federal level, are stuck in a 90s-style stunt politics, things like the convoy. Um, uh, there isn't really another political alternative on the left uh, outside of the Alliance or you know, groups like the, the Workers' Party. Um, and so we've seen this huge, tre this tremendous electoral apathy hit. On the other side of that, I mean, now the Liberal Party are in charge, we have to deal with them for another three years and the clock is ticking. Um, you know, what the hell do we do about that, <laughs> basically? <laughs> it's it's small playing on, it, you know, it's been worrying me since the election. Um, and I, I just wanted to give voice to that one. Uh, and if anyone has any ideas from more advanced sections or people who are actually closer to the, um, to the fight than I am, uh, that would just be, yeah, that would be appreciated. Thanks, Reese. The question at all? Um, we've got Robin, and I just want to say, Robin last week um, was one of the initiators of a motion to support the student strike in the finance sector union. So give a big round of applause for Robin. Yeah. Six years now. So yeah, no, I must, I must be honest, it was actually, it's, um, it actually highlights, it's actually a big opportunity because it was spurred on by um, an activist who was a union member in Westpac. So, we were um, just having our usual reps meeting, and um, this person, who is not really, a, not even a rep or a delegate, decided to, to put a letter to ourselves, the LEC, like, what's the, the union actually going to do about climate change? So, so because of that, um, yeah, we, got, we started thinking. So, I mean, I guess uh, to put it this way, our union is probably the last thing on the agenda in terms of. Um, the whole BAU or business as usual of, of uh, our union. So, in a sense, um, um, it, it needs this sort of. Um, I think it, what it's done is allowed activists to come up, and and um, it's now an opportunity for us to, to use this person to kind of you know be kind of the spokesperson to, to, for other uh, branches within our union. So, so what we've done is we um, she, she she said okay, let's do it, and then um, what what we did was have a look at possible motions, and and I think that. The interesting thing is the emotion we used was actually um, actually more radical type of emotion. So when, when we put it to our okay, let's have a look at this motion. Um, it, it, you know, things like it's caused by um, the corporate greed, etc. Um, you know, should we kind of question that. So what it, what it highlighted was that um, you know you've got these activists who are probably they're purely supporting the the ecological factors, but they haven't got that um, knowledge or connection as to what the root cause is. So. Um, in a sense, ultimately, um, she accepted it, the, the branch accepted it as well, um, and, and it's a really good thing. So I think it, it highlights the fact that there is a lot of education needed as well. So, um, and, and what we do need to go, I think um, you know, Jim probably touched on it as well, if we could, if we could kind of link that um, knowledge in terms of the, the source of it is, is not just you know, the fact that the, the earth is kind of we're kind of screwed because of, of what's happening now. The, the root cause is uh, the corporate greed, and I think what Peter mentioned, banks are intrinsically linked to it, and even like pack and everything, you kind of disassociated themselves. Ultimately, when banks give a loan, right, um, they expect payment back. So whoever um, needs to build be, build these big projects, money needs to be generated. So they'll always be that need, and so capitalism is behind it. So I think all I can say is it's a really good thing. Um, we're trying to organise. Um, we're putting, we're kind of putting a lot of um, flyers for this climate action across each port. And what that does, it helps people see, and people who not, aren't actually union can see it, and they you know, say, okay, it's got union, and it's got you know, climate, and so uh, I think that's a big opportunity as well. So I think, regardless of what happens, where it goes, I think it, it, it kicks something off. It gives a lot of opportunity, it helps us recruit, I mean, the main thing for us is we've got um, declining membership um, across everything. So, I mean, this is one thing in terms of if we can get people excited about this, we can get them into the union as well, and then get the union as well supporting this, whatever it is, it's a win-win. So, uh, we got Tom's in Zip. 
Uh, yeah, look, thank you, Mr. Spark, and contributions, thank you, too, of course. Uh, well, as a teacher who teaches geography, yeah, uh, teaches history, too. Um, yeah, I've worked... defense of geography, No, 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 far from it. No, 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 look, teachers, look, we don't bullshit, and we look in a situation that isn't like, what the hell's got to be done, what is it, what has to be done, let's not bullshit. This is the reality we've got, we're fucked. Unless you do something about capitalism. Uh, I'll say this to some of the teachers, capital, uh, teachers geography, teachers history as well. I've worked with some conservative people out Bush who uh, vote LNP. 30% of the Teachers Federation vote LNP. That's a statement of reality, right? A survey was done, I raised that question at a state council after the election. And, and I've worked with geography teachers that believe in climate change. I've worked with geography teachers who got shares in coal mining and uranium. That's just the reality, right? Yet they'll go out and strike over, say, well, we've had strike in Teachers Federation for 10 years around salaries. But they'll go out over that and it'll be 100% union. Rather, weird contradiction, but it's nature of trade unionism. Because it's a bit like uh, the British Socialist Trade Union leader died back in 2006. Uh, well, John Crow, Tom Crow, I forgot his name, but he says, I'm not here to tweak capitalism, I'm not here to smash the fucking crap out of it. And that's the attitude we've got to take. Uh, point Steve said about Green New Deal and so forth. Uh, you know, it's like I had this thing from Buddy uh, Bernie Sanders talking about democratic socialism versus corporate socialism. He's making the point about all the money going towards the fossil fuel industry in the States, or the subsidies, Jim had a point about Adani. Uh, and it's true, you've got this thing now about nuclear power. Nuclear power is like a mad Keynesian thing. It's always been state supported. It takes 10 years to build a nuclear power station, yet it's been put forward, oh, this is an alternative to climate change. No, it isn't. Like, I remember we had mass ma marches against uranium mining in the 70s. And we didn't, the only nuclear power station it's research, not really power. This week is hot, but it was against uranium mining. There's still a lot of attitude against regard to nuclear waste for a dump in Australia. Um, I'm saying this in an honest perspective because I do think we've got some major problems too. Because we look at, say, Adani, uh, this is just Adani, uh, there's a big problem of artificial intelligence and replacing jobs. There'll be construction of so many <coughs> jobs in that actual mine, but it's all going to be high tech and it's going to be wiping a lot of jobs out, like uh, Reinhardt's mines in WA. And this is highly skilled work, uh, driving a 40 ton truck into those open cut mines she's got. It's all been done by one place in Perth in the warehouse for all her open cut mines in WA now. That's going to go even further, that's going to affect a lot of people. So it's putting the alternative up, we do about jobs, and we think about not just the fossil fuel industry, which is bad, I mean, I'm sure people up in Lithgow, which isn't too far from America too, but they're one nation as well, because uh, we've got coal pits up there. But I've seen first hand just driving through the upper uh, Hunter Valley, uh, people out there just looking at the open cuts, look like a lunar landscape's got more life in it after the mining's been done. Um, and the whole thing about coal gas, <laughs> we don't have much water in this country. We certainly don't have much room in such a long drought. Mm -hmm. um, and what, just what affects the water type on the artesian basin. Now, so, and I'll also a couple of positive things as a geography teacher and history teacher. I'm really wrapped in regard to kids I teach going out in a climate strike. Basically, all my year eight class went out, which was really. <coughs> there wasn't many kids at my school I teach that could say, well, okay, it's the mountains, right? But I mean, the same kids, what you were saying about not turning up the other stuff. Um, we had a big march, and Jim was there uh, against the raising of Warra Gamba Dam by about 14 metres. And. It was that to like a thousand people in Katoomba. And to me it was like a parent teacher not, because it wasn't just kids, it was their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Which was really cool. I love you like Katoomba. Uh, but it was really quite good because people were looking at it and 
Uh, it was good to see people get involved about the whole thing about this bullshit. Like, it isn't going to be stopping any was it 100 million year flood or whatever. It's basically not going to stop any flood, but it's going to open up the Pean River uh, for residential development stuff that like up by the Alan Poo. You know, it isn't going to stop any floods at all. It's just an excuse to sort of stuff up at the backwash. When we do get a big rain again, it's going to wipe out a lot of National Park, it's going to wipe out a lot of Gunungara First Nation sites, it's going to be a nightmare in many ways. Uh, getting back to the whole thing as unions and I guess we ought to start talking about references to the BLF for me. I guess you had that social justice unionism that had an environmental base to it in regard not just to green bands but a lot of things in regard to social justice policies. First unit you know, really made a big link with First Nations people going back to Bob Pringle who's also the major person in regard to uh, Kelly Bush and the Green Bands. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that go be looked at too. I think we've got to look at the whole thing about jobs like Badgerys Creek is a ecological body nightmare on its own right for Western Sydney. Uh, the whole thing about the aviation industry, we've got 1,700 planes flying across Australia and landing each day, uh, which is massive when you think about it, but also the effect on the uh, the effect on the environment, too, in many ways, in regard to the fuel being burnt at such a high altitude. But also, just a trivial thing, had someone from the Firefighters Union on the ABC yesterday talking about how unsafe they are for little things like plane crashes out of major airports, like little things like lack of training, lack of equipment. I'm thinking, hang on, these are these massive terminals now. Like, Melbourne Sydney is now was it, the third or fourth highest patronised air corridor in the world. Um, Sydney to Brisbane's at 15th. It's just amazing you think about that, the way capitalism's going, that nature, but how we take that on. Uh, on a positive, another positive thing as well, I guess, too, the fact that we're talking about this, these issues now and people, on a broader perspective, it's pretty amazing when we have such a controlled media in Australia by Murdoch, mm. um, which is being pushing all the anti-science stuff, all the racism, all the bigotry, all the dumbing down. Yeah. But I do think, like, just a general thing too, just that artificial intelligence thing, I think that's a big thing, not just in regard to the pits, but the way it's going to be affecting jobs in this country, or jobs across the world too. Well, Todd, okay, we've got Rev and then Stephen, and then we'll hear from the panel, so, um, and we'll cut into a little bit of, of, of break time, but not too much, so yeah. I mean, my question is more seeing the climate change movement as a tool for system change. And I guess in this, like, look at the Green New Deal, even they only climate this changes everything, and it's all talking. So, chief, sort of climate change action, we need to then be dealing with workers' rights and Indigenous rights, frontline communities, and so forth. So, I guess I'm wondering, do you see, or should the climate change movement be engaging more with, say, women's rights movements, refugee rights movements, and so forth? And I guess in Australia, especially, where to achieve a lot of the questions around climate action and climate justice, we need to see a massive power shift away from the fossil fuel corporations. Thanks, sir. Stephen? OK, briefly, what always goes through to my mind is, is the Chomsky quote, the bludgeon to the authoritarian state, that's what propaganda is to democracy. And we're just getting loads and loads of just propaganda that undermines what we do. And we have to have our own information. And I know that Green Left Weekly is absolutely doing its best, but I just think we should make demands on the democratisation of the ABC, along lines that people in Socialist Life have already said. We need a real freeing up of the organs of discussion and, and uh, real proper discussion, not bullshit, you know, confected rubbish. Um, so, uh, yeah, look, just to say, just well done what you well done on today and the speakers, fantastic speakers, and just to think about them the media and, and maybe giving young, if we can have one or two articles by actual young people, uh, if they're around, you can do that. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so, open up to the panel again. Who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. oh. um, I'd like to start just by answering a couple of questions that I've heard. Um, Luke, you mentioned the um, the Adani mine and jobs. And it's really interesting because when you look at the statistics, it's only about 
In Australia, it's 99.5% of Australians who work in coal, and then in Queensland, it's only 98.8%. So really, it is, um, when you look at, I mean, our government will try and tell you how many jobs there's going to be and how many people's lives are going to be affected by coal mining, but um, it is actually quite a small amount, and has been mentioned, the Adani mine, a lot of the jobs involved in that uh, are automated, they're not done by humans. So our government has been lying about the number of jobs being created, and it's so frustrating. And um, Jonathan, you mentioned um, sort of repercussions uh, representing schools at strikes. The worst I've heard of after school detentions, maybe I think schools have threatened to suspend students for three days up to a week, but really um, the worst I've heard is detentions. Um, Reese, you mentioned your frustration about the Liberal Party, and I wholeheartedly understand that. It is so frustrating, especially as someone who can't vote, um, to see time and time again this unstable, this disgusting, foul government keep winning. It's so frustrating. How do they keep getting in? I remember before the election, I was saying, oh, I think Labour's really going to get it this time. And I was, I, I really believe that people were starting to wake up to the right-wing uh, uh, governments that we have. But it turns out they didn't. And it was just such a disappointment. And there was this point, I was watching all the votes um, coming in you know, live. And there was this point where Labour was ahead by about two votes, and I was just this little bit of hope, and then I kept counting them, and Labour skyrocketed. It was so just, it was like we entered a parallel universe at that point. It was so, it was so weird. And I am so frustrated because I don't know what to do with myself, because it's another three years, and we've only, that's three years out of 11 years. And all I can do, and all anyone else can do, is channel that frustration and anger into action. Mm. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you know, sitting at home all day being sad about the climate emergency <laughs> isn't going to do anything. Actually, being in the streets, being involved with things, that's what's going to implement change. And I know that Extinction Rebellion are planning their um, international Rebellion Week in October, I think the 7th, so there's probably going to be some big stuff then. Mm. And it's really about sort of uh, encouraging the movement, moving it forward rather than giving up hope. And there are a lot of people that I know where they've reached that point where they don't, they can't see much point in action anymore because you know, we've, if we've only got 11 years, then might as well just make the most of it and not act. <laughs> yeah. um, but the most, even, even if we are facing um, a climate emergency, at least we can go knowing that we tried. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's comforting, you know, that at least I'm, I'm doing something and so many other people are actually doing something. <coughs> and it's this weird coming together of all these people with a common goal and I've just I've met so many people it was like in the course of, of a month um, I'd like that first strike my life just changed completely <laughs> it was sort of before then I was just kind of like oh climate change is bad and then I came to the strike and it was like no this is climate change threatens my entire existence and it threatens the entire continued existence of human life yeah. And this uh, sort of sense of, of emergency was really put into me. And even though, you know, I know all the facts, I know about the devastation it's going to cause, the most that I can do is to continue to fight mm. and um, strive for that justice in action. Yay. Um, what was it Napoleon, somebody asked Napoleon what his, what his battle plan was, you know, what is the secret to his military genius or something, and I think his response was, you know, well, first we fight and then we see, so, <laughs> and I guess really that's, that's, um, 
that's that's the message that you know we've got coming through. We can't see the future. We don't, you know, but. If we have a strategy of actually taking on and challenging the capitalist system and, and challenging the fossil fuel industry or actually challenging the capitalist system, then, and given the crisis that, you know, the 10 year scenario that really we have opening up for us, it's, it's just a question I'm saying, the political opportunities one would hope would arise and that when we do have that chance, we actually act on them and, and, and don't miss that opportunity. And, 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 and it, look, to me, it's a question of hope. And to sort of touch on, on Reese's question, I guess the question was, you, you think back the electoral cycles. I can remember, you know, Whitlam was coming in. We had hope. Well, and a bit of, bit of and, and some of that hope was kind of like, well, Reese, sort of like we achieved some things out of that Whitlam victory. We had the hawk, you know, hawk coming into power. Mm, we had, there was hope. <laughs> Disappointed. Uh, we had Rudd coming into power. There was kind of like hope. And so I disappointed. We had um, what was his name? Eminently forgettable. Um, no, Shorten. no, Shorten. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Did we did we have hope? No, no. no. Really? Did anybody? You know, you said, oh, they're two way. You know, two points ahead. What? 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 For us, you know, for them, they had to be twenty points ahead. I think that's just reflective. You know, you can't. You know, you can't talk about a transition, that was the thing. At least the Labour Party, first time, heard them talking about transition. We've been talking transition 10 years or more. <coughs> and at least they're talking about transition. But you can't be talking about transition and, you know, having two bob each way on a dining mine, really. It was kind of like, it was a, it was a exactly. con... Sorry? And then open up the whole of Yeah, e e exactly. It was just so like, you know, no real, no real sense of, of hope. But, you know, but there is hope. You know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the fact that she can be elected, I think... Was less than a year ago, was it, that she was elected? What an impact she's, you know, yeah. she's made on the world to be elected, openly identifying as a socialist. You know, the ongoing, ongoing sort of like ideas that Bernie Sanders is, is pushing. Okay, there may be misplaced hope there, but at least there's some sort of hope. And I think that's the really inspiring thing that, you know, that the Green New Deal can win mass support. It shows us the potential. Sure, there's sort of like, you know, some the old, you know, familiar liberals and familiar sort of like Labor, Labor, Labor bureaucrats that are totally tied in with the, with the Democrats saying, well, you know, it you know, won't go anywhere. But really, I mean, you look at the whole thing. About, we know about the Green New Deal all around the world. It, it's kind of like put it on the agenda. We just got to think of a way in which we can, we can you know, pa package it and popularise it in Australia. So it sort of like has that has a sort of like Green New Deal. It sort of like really refers to, to, the, to this sort of like progressive movements and the big rise of, of unions and, and industrial consciousness that, that happened in the United States uh, in the 1930s. And I don't think that, you know, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is consciously sort of like mis misleading people. I heard an interview once and talking about the limitations of the Roosevelt New Deal and how it didn't actually apply to, to people of colour, didn't apply to Puerto Ricans, like her, her, her own background didn't apply to black people. So there's sort of like an awareness of, of the limitations of, of, of that you know, previous F. Franklin Delano Roosevelt you know, strategy of the 1930s, but also you know, it's, I think it has a, a, a different context uh, in the United States at the moment, but it does, to me, what it does show is, is the possibility of, of, of hope. And look, and, and the high school students. Not uh, far be it for me to want to, you know, tell high school students how to do it. Hey, fantastic job! We're so inspired to see so many people coming out. But it's not the first time. <laughs> yeah, and you've got, you know, you've got the same issues that you, you know, you're facing now about time. Um, hey, you know, will they let us go to school? Early 1970s. Remember, remember the same discussions. You know, you know, were we allowed to go out on out, out of school to, um, you know, to strike? Uh, and, and then the same issues came up in, uh, in 1997, 1998, when the massive high school student strikes that, um, that Socialist Alliance was um, supportive of um, against Pauline Hanson, against racism. So, yeah, it's really interesting to hear those sort of, you know, and they're familiar, they sort of like sound familiar, but it means that the movement is actually discussing real issues. And, and, and it comes in the context is that the kind of like elites are trying to think, how can we stop, you know, how can we stop you school students, you know? And, and even enlist, you know, the despicable people like Ro what's it, Andrew Bolt. Andrew Bolt. Oh, really? I mean, could you believe it, you know? So when you've got enemies like that, you know, you're doing a, a fantastic job. <laughs> 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 Uh, 
Um, thank you so much, everyone, for the fantastic, fantastic discussion. Uh, I really appreciate being, being a part of that. And uh, I think it's only the beginning of these kinds of discussions. There will be many, many more over, um, over the coming years. Um, in terms of dealing with some of the questions, there's a question about um, coal mining communities. Um, one Nation, they didn't just have the coal miner who is a CFMEU member um, in the Hunter Valley, they also had a coal miner um, running in Capricornia, which is the, the seat um, where the Adani mine um, could potentially be. Um, and if you go to their website, you'll see they've got a very elaborate climate benign platform that was just developed um, at the beginning and updated at the beginning of this year. So it really is a very concerted strategy for them, um, and it's worth having a look at some of that stuff that they're putting out, because clearly they're putting it out um, in communities, and it's um, getting, you know, it's having it's having some appeal as well. Um, in terms of the, the issue of, just to, to, to carry that on a bit further, the small numbers of jobs in the coal mining industry, that's absolutely true, but I think it's really important how we actually deal with that question. We can't just say it's a small number of jobs it doesn't really matter. We actually have to say it's a small number of jobs. Therefore, the question of actually buying people out, funding people, finding new jobs is not an impossible question. Um, but we do need to take seriously uh, what that process will be, um, or we're just never, you know, we'll be stuck uh, rerunning that federal election um, over and over again. Um, Steve mentioned the CFMU report. Um, I think there is now recognition to at least some extent within the CFMEU that that report really didn't go far enough. It actually offers quite a um, neoliberal solution. It basically, apologies for that. <laughs> didn't turn that off. Um, it basically says um, that you know you can set up. You know, if you've got a coal mining area, you can set up universities and colleges. Have sort of seed grants for entrepreneurial businesses and then somehow magically like jobs will be created um, and fun, you know everyone everything will be fine um, clearly you know that <laughs> that report got turned into ALP policy it went to an election nobody bought it so there's a real need um, to revisit to revisit that um, and the other thing that I think is really important is having like um, you can't just, it's, I think it's, it's been a problem within the environmental movement actually to just talk about coal as an, as an undifferentiated kind of substance. Um, coal is used for different things. Uh, it's used in different places. Uh, we've got thermal coal that's burnt for electricity within Australia. Um, those uh, plants will, you know, do have lifespans, will potentially be shutting down. The uh, CFMEU in that report, the Labour Party and its policy is acknowledging the fact that that is something that will happen. We've got the challenges around, you know, it's all privately owned, we don't know when they're gonna function, the electricity grid is gonna have to change in order to accommodate, accommodate that. But that, um, that's a kind of different question from the exported thermal coal. Um, and I think, you know, while it's certainly important to raise the question about the, the, um, uh, the responsibility that we have in Australia for thermal coal exports, they're actually being used for electricity systems in other countries. Uh, and so I think actually we need to think about how can we be a part of a global movement to transform all of those electricity systems, uh, be joined up with campaigns in those countries to do that. Uh, there are actually an astonishing number of coal-fired power plants being built in Indonesia, in China, in India. Um, so wouldn't it be better if we could actually be a part of movements to help actually you know, <laughs> reduce the impact that those uh, plants are going to have in those countries as we also campaign to stop uh, thermal coal production here? And then, of course, there's the question of the metallurgical coal that's used to make steel. We need steel to build windmills, to build all sorts of other things. So uh, how are we actually going to um, press forward with the science and the technological developments uh, that will actually facilitate the production of steel that doesn't require uh, building coal, to make sure that more steel is recycled so that we don't have to make um, as much coal as well. So I think those are some of the real questions that we've got to deal with. Um, in terms of the issue around um, automation, I um, completely agree that that's a big issue and it comes up in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of places. Um, the primary thing 
that the Maritime Union has uh, campaigned for around that um, is reduction of hours in work. We've actually managed to get agreements on automated terminals like the Hutchison one here in Port Botany that people have a 30 hour work week. Um, as a result, you know, that was negotiated as part of the introduction of automation. That doesn't completely solve the jobs question, um, but it certainly goes a long way to helping it. The other important thing is um, a rehire list, um, so that what the, the pattern that we found um, is that when automation is brought in, there's a massive overestimation of how many people they can sack. Of course, they want to get rid of the union activists first, but if you can bring in a rehire list that makes sure that anybody who's forced to go out is first on the list to get back in again, at least you can try and keep um, the workforce intact to some extent. Um, one of the things that the union's campaigning for in relation to offshore wind is to get the construction jobs within offshore wind to be on better rosters. So right now, most seafarers are on an equal time roster, um, but there's such a thing as a Norwegian roster, which comes from Scandinavian countries, which is actually better than an equal time <coughs> roster, and therefore creates more jobs as well. So we want, uh, we want, you know, that's what we want the, the new renewable industry jobs to look like, because we know there's a real need um, for job creation, not only for seafarers working in the offshore oil and gas industry, but also for other workers coming out of the coal mining and power industry um, as well, and that's really important, you know, the government, you can't rely on the government to deliver that, so if we're going to have a transition and encourage um, people being able to move to jobs, then unions need to take um, a lead role in that as well. Um, in terms of the question of the next three years, I mean, people have already covered it, but the only thing we can do um, is use that as an opportunity to build to build our movement, to build the links between all those movements, to build the politics of the movement, the strength of the movement. Um, and just, just so that people, um, I was reviewing the numbers the other day. On the 15th of March, we had one and a half people, one and a half million students, mostly students, not entirely students, around the world on strike. We had 150,000, mostly students, not entirely students, in Australia. Um, pretty amazing numbers, and I think the 20th of September will be much bigger than that again. So looking at very, very significant numbers of people. But I think one of the key things, uh, one of the key debates that we keep having along the way is, you know, can we just leave it to the students? Um, and there is a little bit of a tendency, um, and it often comes, I think, from conservative places to say, well, okay, we can't take this initiative. We need to check with the students. What do the students think? That kind of a thing. And while like they have provided an extraordinary degree of leadership and passion and kick this off thing off, it's actually irresponsible of everyone else to just leave it to the students. They don't actually have the social power that's going to be needed to transform society. Um, and so we really need to take the responsibility, and students are actively asking for this. You know, Greta Thunberg the other day saying, where are the adults? Um, uh, so our students in Sydney have made, you know, very similar requests um, of you know, activists and unionists here too, um, to do what we can um, to build that movement, to take that responsibility um, and build, you know, wherever it is that we are exactly the kinds of things that Robin described doing. It's fantastic to hear there's going to be climate strike posters in the halls of the Westpac headquarters. That's brilliant. Um, and let's just, you know, spread that example all around Sydney and all around Australia. I think we're all fun movements here, and, um, and I think that there's a lot of adults in the room, and, um, and this was a very interesting and very stimulating discussion. Um, I think it's you know very inspiring and incumbent on all of us who haven't taken it to the unions or the community organisation or the parent teachers association that we're part of to go, okay, all right, this student strikes on. Um, I wanted to make a few announcements. I know there's an action and a rally against Mike Pompey, which a couple of comrades are going to go to. Um, now at 12 o'clock, Mike Pompeo at the State Library. Pompeo at the State Library. Um, Hopefully you'll Pompeo, um, go the way So Pompeii. yes, you probably should go to that by all means, that's um, a couple. But on the anti-war theme, Green Left Weekly is hosting, um, or the office here is hosting, a Stop the War discussion on the eyewitness the second of Fallujah, Iraq. So um, that's on Tuesday, August the 20th here. 
So people put that in your diary, come along with Ross Capitoos, the former US veteran, a former US veteran, and Donna Mulhern from um, uh, Peace Pilgrim, who went to Fallujah. Um, the other thing that Green Left Weekly is hosting, the office here, is help bring women of steel to the big screen. So there was a massive 14 year fight to get women jobs in the steelworks in, um, in Wollongong, in VHP. So we've got uh, Rita Malia from the Centre of New South Wales, Robin Murphy, who is a job school living home planner over that 14 years down in Wollongong, and Sarah Gregson from the NTU. So that's going to be on Thursday, August the 29th. And in the West, um, there's a film screening, This Changes Everything, which was Naomi Klein's very seminal latest release. Oh, uh, no, she's got another one, but a second ago latest release. Um, Capitalism versus the Environment, fantastic doco, uh, very inspiring and for our, for people who know activists out in Sydney's West, a real shot in the arm. So that's on Saturday, September 14. And if you're not on the email list, stick yourself down. That's a once a week calendar of rallies, film screenings and events. Um, and Fred, would you um, wave the supporter drive leaflet? One final pitch. Um, Green Lake Weekly, unfortunately, um, as everyone knows, money doesn't come from the trees. It's a class um, development construct. And, um, and Green Lake Weekly really needs your support. So the digital age is really upon us. So we're asking people to um, dig once a month into their MasterCard or Visa pockets and give us $5 a month um, for a digital copy or up to $20, $50 a month for a hard copy and a digital copy. So you get your first month free for a week and a half. Um, that's right. And Fred's got the, the details there. So